Good morning. Good morning again to all of you. And I just want to tell you what an honor it is and a joy to be able to co-lead worship this morning with Sarah Reed, Reverend Sarah Reed, while Reverend Tim is spending some time with his family. Would you please pray with me? O oh, Holy One, come to us now. Touch us, move us, and speak to us through your word and through the words that you place on each of our hearts. And oh dear God, may the words that I have to offer here this morning please you and honor you and glorify your holy, holy name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, here we are. Here we are. It is now the fourth Sunday of Easter. And the messages of our lectionary readings these past few weeks have been clear and direct and challenging and even confrontational about what it means not just to celebrate the resurrection on Easter Sunday, but what it means to live as a resurrection people every day throughout the year. Now, back on that second Sunday of Easter, as you may recall, in our reading from John, that doubting Thomas, as he is often referred to, represents all of us in our own moments of uncertainty and doubt. And yet, and yet this story also teaches us that the risen one is always actively present in our lives through the gift of our faith and our belief. And then last Sunday, on the third Sunday of Easter, in that familiar road to Emmaus story from Luke, we are again challenged to open our hearts and open our minds, open our spirits and open our eyes that we might recognize and experience the presence and the nearness of Jesus, who accompanies each one of us along the road that we travel as we navigate our life's journey. And so, now on this fourth Sunday of Easter in chapter 10, the Gospel writer of John who clearly had been inspired by the numerous references to God as shepherd throughout the Hebrew scriptures, presents to us in this text what is often referred to as the Good Shepherd Discourse. And so here, in just these 10 verses of our reading today, we are given the image of Jesus as both the shepherd and, later on in this passage, Jesus also identifies himself as the gate. Jesus is the gate, and we are the sheep. Now, this story on the surface seems to be teaching us that we cannot enter the pasture without first passing through the gate. Jesus as the gate. Jesus is the gate. How does this image work for you? Jesus as the gate. In my personal life, there have been times when I have felt a bit like a lost sheep or uncertain about my future plans or direction in my life. And so, seeing Jesus as the gate has encouraged me during those times to become more prayerful and intentional and discerning and trusting of God's unfolding path before me. 
Jesus, as the gate, has grounded me during those times and helped me to find my way forward. However, however, I am also aware that some Christians sometimes use these very same words in ways that exclude others. For instance, when I was in college many, many, many moons ago, I became involved with a campus ministry for a time. And I can remember that one of the campus ministers referenced this very passage by insisting that his Jewish roommate and his Muslim neighbor would never know the truth unless they would finally come to understand that Jesus is the only gate to eternal life. It wasn't long after that that I left that campus ministry. And I made the effort to find a United Church of Christ congregation in downtown Pittsburgh and made that my church home during the rest of my college years. Jesus is the gate to welcoming and inclusive communities. The gate is wide open here at First Congregational Church, United Church of Christ. And on this very, very special day, we are celebrating with Cindy and Al and Gary, and Claudia, and Susie, and Austin, and Michael, and their sweet little girl, Corey, and Doug, and Haley, and Noah, and their baby, Astrid, and Terry. And on this day, we are all choosing to covenant with them and with one another in love and faith in God and through the gift of this blessed community. On this day, when we have received 11 new members, and in a few moments, we will also be honoring one of the sages among us, the one and only the inimitable Mr. Rick Sayre, that last verse of our gospel reading seems to be amplified today. Can't you just hear Jesus proclaiming and exclaiming those words of that last verse? I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. An abundant life, an abundant life. Much has been written in scripture about what it means to live abundantly. Throughout the Bible, God demonstrates unending generosity and shares the abundance of her creation with humankind. And in the gospel miracle stories and parables, Jesus modeled for his followers a new way of living together and caring for one another and sharing with each other and without any fear of scarcity. Embracing a theology of abundance is an intentional way of living together in community with one another. Furthermore, a theology of abundance is a direct challenge and a direct contradiction to the individualism and consumerism that dominate our society today. Believing in a theology of abundance is indeed a choice and a spiritual practice and a way of life. 
As you reflect on the ministries of First Church in recent times, where have you witnessed the theology of abundance being lived out? Well, just this past week, between 1,600 and 1,700 individuals of various congregations and faith traditions across our city showed up, stood up, and spoke up for justice. And I know many of you were there. That took place at the Nehemiah Action Bread Assembly. And it was about 75 of you that participated from First Church. This is an example of a theology of abundance. And here at church, earlier this month, we hosted what I believe was our first ever Easter egg hunt on Easter Sunday, thanks to the leadership of Emily Schmidt and Joanna McWilliams and Wendy Kennedy. And we really weren't sure how many children and families to expect. We were hoping, as I recall, about 10 or 15. That was our hope. And as it turned out, there were over 40 children with their families, their parents and their grandparents, who participated in that event on Easter morning. This ministry to young families reflects the theology of abundance. And in our music ministry program during the recent interim time before Josh arrived last month, it was absolutely amazing to witness just how many folks stepped forward to share their gifts of music and leadership and time, including Jim and Barry and Jennifer and David and Anne and Sandy and Marty and Joel and so many others. This is an example of the theology of abundance. We don't have to look very far for examples of how we are living abundantly here at First Church and in our wider community and in our personal lives as well. In our gospel reading for today, Jesus tells us and assures us and promises us that he came that we may have life and have it abundantly. I'd like to close with a few words from Wendell Berry. I'm sure many of you are familiar with Wendell Berry. He's probably about 80 years old now. He is an environmental activist, a farmer, a poet, an author. And I want to share these closing words from his poem, which is called The Wild Geese. What we need is here. And we pray not for new earth or heaven, but to be quiet in heart and in eye clear. What we need is already here. Thanks be to God. Amen.